So first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate it. So as Brian said, I'm here today to talk about my thesis work on a usability evaluation that I ran at the Boeing Company. I just started. Um, so before I get into the specifics of my own study, I want to talk about obviously the background and motivation that got me there. So since its inception over a century ago, virtual reality has really undergone a dramatic transformation. It's now a technology-based experience that's used widely as a functional tool. We've seen virtual reality applications in fields as varied as virtual manufacturing to architectural walkthroughs to exposure therapy for drug addiction and PTSD. And while the opportunities for applications seem to be expanding continuously, how do we know that these applications are actually providing a benefit? So there are some obvious benefits to the industries. For example, virtual manufacturing eliminates the need for costly physical mock-ups. But what are the benefits to the user of the system? So over the past 20 years or so, people have really begun to take a closer look at this kind of question. And there's been a lot of progress made in the usability and evaluation of this new technology. But I think there's still some work to be done in this area. And that is what this thesis is meant to help address. So the motivation for my study really came three years ago when I started working at the Boeing Company. And I started to learn more about how the company was using virtual reality on a day-to-day -day basis. So one system in particular, it's called SCID, but it's with a picture on the right here. It's basically a wall-sized rear projected display that has stereo and head tracking. And uh, the navigation is uh, with a fly stick that's just an inset there. But so it's used regularly today in design and review sessions for a number of different visualization tasks. So for example, tracing an installation path for a particular part through an airplane to try to detect interference with other parts or uh, just to make sure that there's enough clearance for the installation. Or another example would be um, comparing the same part from two different design releases, two different airplane design releases to get uh, an idea of preference for design. It's also used for ergonomic evaluations, which is actually what the picture there. Um, so you see there's a human model input, and they basically uh, evaluate different jobs for ergonomic risk factors using the system. And while the system is regularly used today, and um, Boeing just actually purchased a second system, uh, there haven't been any formal evaluations to show, there haven't been any formal studies to show that this actually provided benefit over the standard desktop approach. So while the ICID system itself has not been tested for these visualization tasks, there have been two previous studies that have been run that looked at Boeing data, so Boeing airplane models, for these types of visualization tasks across different display devices. And these are going to look <laughs> familiar to many of you in the room. <laughs> so the first one on the left here is Dave's study. It was run in 2002. And um, he compared, or he, Dave and colleagues prepared uh, compared a desktop display on the bottom there as kind of the control condition, so how the design uh, and evaluation reviews are held, to, you know, are, were currently being done. The middle is a plasma panel with a 50-inch screen, and then the top is an open vision station. It's a, it's a hemispherical display. The, the follow-up study, which was done in 2004 at UBC, um, measured again a desktop as a control condition, but they compared. A cave, just a cave environment and a, and a, a tile wall display. So obviously the, the second study had more immersive screens, um, and they also showed, uh, they also compared uh, stereo rendering and head tracking conditions. So uh, the main question for both of these studies was the question that I asked at the outset, which was, do these systems or larger, more immersive displays actually provide a performance benefit for these, these types of visualization tasks over the standard approach? In this case, it was a, a standard 20 inch monitor. So, I'm going to talk about the tasks in a little bit more detail because they're, the, these studies really form the foundation of my own research. So, I want, I want the tasks to be clear. I use the same task in my own study. So, the first task is called Where's Waldo? And it's a navigational search task. Um, the, the, basic, the basic steps of the task are that the participant is shown an image of the target part. And then the, the task is to navigate through a section, a subsection of the airplane to find the target part within its context. The second task is called Hansel and Gretel, and this one is a wayfinding task. And 
the basics of the task are the same as the where's well the task, with the exception that before navigating to the target part, participants are first passively led to the target. So um, if in this case, they were, you know, the experimenter indirectly led them to the target part and then uh, brought them back to the, the starting position. And then the task from there was to find their way back to the target. Um, so again, the main, the main goal of both of these studies was to determine whether or not there was a performance benefit. In this case, these tasks are measured based on completion time and accuracy. Accuracy meaning that the participant found the correct target part. And um, both of the studies found no performance benefit to the larger, more immersive displays. So participants did not perform significantly better on the larger, more immersive displays. In fact, in Dave's study, they performed better on the desktop uh, in, under all conditions. Um, so both studies actually suggest other influences that might be more impactful on, on performance on these types of visualization tasks. So specifically, um, they mention that individual differences probably are, are very influential and also uh, visual fidelity. So while, while those are the two most relevant studies looking at Boeing data specifically, there is a huge body of work, a lot, many, many studies that have evaluated different design aspects of virtual reality that have compared you know, different, different virtual reality displays to each other, for example, or interaction devices or rendering techniques. But uh, I, you know, I obviously don't have time to go into all of these in detail, but there are four main points that I want to talk about. Um, the first is that there is really wide variation in terms of the devices tested. So, you know, in this case, the most relevant is, is displays. So, I just talked about two studies that, um, between the two studies, there were five different displays tested. Um, there's also many, many different interaction devices as well that have been tested. But, um, so, wide variation in terms of the displays, as well as abstraction in terms of the tasks. So, most of the research looks at um, abstract tasks purposefully because they want to be able to generalize their results. Um, and the environments that they look at are, to use the, the term in Dave's paper, semi-structured rather than structured, which you know, an airplane model is a structured environment versus an unstructured uh, virtual environment that's most commonly used. So if you are a user or potential user of virtual reality for a very specific task or a very specific kind of data, how do you look at this body of work and try to determine whether or not a, a larger, more immersive display or just a VR system in general will be beneficial for that, that application? Uh, some, there have been books and papers written that have tried to kind of survey, survey the literature and come up with guidelines for how to, how to apply virtual reality in different contexts. And actually, the guidelines suggest that immersive dis larger, more immersive displays should be beneficial for the types of tasks that we just looked at. And obviously, the results uh, were not in line with that. <coughs> the third point I have is that while most of the literature is, very, is more general, um, there, there have been very specific industry validations of different systems. Um, but they, look, they focus on the concept of using virtual reality for a specific task rather than the user benefits. So what I mean by that is they, they focus on whether or not a system can accurately assemble, a, you can use a system to accurately assemble a part, just, to, just for a general example. But they don't, ask, they don't ask whether or not the user can understand the assembly process better or can perform it faster. My, the fourth point is, I think, very important, and it's that individual differences are often overlooked in all of these evaluations. Not all of them, but they're often overlooked. And this is a problem because individual differences have been shown in the literature to be very powerful predictors of spatial, of spatial performance in both virtual and real-world environments. Actually, spatial some, some individual differences, specifically spatial ability and gender and interface potentially, have been shown to be the most powerful predictors of spatial performance and spatial knowledge acquisition. So in other words, more powerful than environmental variables like display type and interaction device and, and rendering technique. So, uh, and, and with that in mind, mo most studies still continue to overlook them or do not incorporate them, at least control for them in their studies. So 
just to summarize kind of where I see the gap in the literature or the opportunity for further research, um, the first point is just that there are virtual, rea virtual reality applications in use today for which the benefits haven't actually been formally quantified for the intended tasks and the intended users, and I think that part is really important. Um, the second point is that there's wide variation in terms of the tasks and devices tested, which I just talked about. Um, again, industry validation focus on concept rather than user benefits. And then most of the evaluations in the literature um, fail to account for individual differences. So with these limitations in mind, I, I designed and performed a set designed and performed a study that evaluated a very specific VR system that's in use today at the Boeing Company for the intended users and tasks. Um, again, the tasks were very specific and the data. Um, my study focused pr primarily on user benefits in terms of performance benefit and also preference. And individual differences were not only measured but used as covariates in my analysis. There were three main research questions that I had going into this research. The first was the same question as, as David and Collins from those studies, which were, was basically that, uh, what is the effect of display type? So I compared the CID system to a standard desktop, and, and I used the exact same two tasks, the cancel and rental and the work workload tasks. So I was wondering, what is the effect of display type on navigation and wayfinding? Uh, my hypothesis was that I, my, my results would be in line with the previous two studies. In other words, I did not think that there would be a, a main effect of display type. However, I did think that the interaction between display type and individual differences would be significant. Specifically, I think that I thought that um, those with a lot of experience and with this kind of data and this kind of task would perform better under familiar conditions. So in this case, it would be a desktop display with flat shading. My second research question is, what is the effect of shading? So if you remember before I said that it was suggested that maybe visual fidelity would be a significant factor in uh, odd performance for these types of tasks. And shading is obviously only one measure of visual fidelity, but um, I measured flat shading versus smooth shading. And I'm wondering again, what is the impact on navigation and wayfinding performance? So uh, my hypothesis again was that the main effect would not be significant, but that the interaction would be. And in this case specifically, I thought that people that did not have prior experience or a prior bias towards a certain type of shading um, would see a performance benefit from higher fidelity visuals, or in other words, the, the smooth shading condition. And this is because the literature suggests that high fidelity visuals provide um, facilitate the acquisition of spatial knowledge, which is obviously required for these tasks. Uh, my third research question is, again, just what is the impact of individual differences? Specifically, I was really interested in prior experience and spatial ability. Um, so I, my hypothesis is obviously, I've already talked about the interactions that I, I suspect, but I, I basically I thought that they would be significant predictors of performance. So just to give a quick overview of my experimental design. So I had my main, my main variables were display. Um, and the, display the two display conditions also had different interaction places, so I just wanted to note that there, that it was a confounding variable. So there were two, display, two display conditions and two shading conditions. And it was within subjects two by two design. Um, under all, in all four conditions, participants performed both tasks, always beginning with the words Waldo tasks. I had 28 participants, 11 females, 17 males. Uh, my measures were the same. They were completion time and accuracy. Again, accuracy meaning they found the correct target part. And then my covariates were all of the individual differences factors. So gender um, was one of them. Spatial ability, I, I, used, I, I gave participants a pretest. Um, I used the Gilbert Zimmerman spatial orientation test. It's, it was pictured here. I used the online version. The main task is basically to uh, look at the bow of the boat in the first scene and determine how it's moved in the second scene and, and input that with the mouse. Um, so that was my measure of spatial ability. And then I also gave participants a, a, a computer experience questionnaire, which was developed and uh, validated by Dave Waller. And it, 
uh, basically provides two measures. One is a measure of a person's self-reported experience with computers and also self-reported attitude towards them. Okay, so yeah, jumping into my results. Okay, so I'll talk about the, the two tasks separately. Um, my, main, my main variables first. So for the navigation, the navigational search task, where is Waldo? Participants were faster on the immersive display, although the main uh, main variable, the main effect was not significant. So uh, you see that on the, on the graph down here. It just shows the, the averages for both. Um, for the main effect of shading, this was significant, and participants were flat, faster in the flat shading conditions. So on to the, um, the interactions. So there was a significant interaction of display type and spatial ability. So you see, I, I input the averages for the different groups in terms of spatial ability, so I kind of chunked them. So you know, the, the top eight, the middle eight, the bottom eight in terms of spatial ability. And so you see that those with high spatial ability, which is the dark blue, uh, performed better on the desktop display, which is opposite to the other groups. So the other groups performed better on an immersive display. The people with high spatial ability performed better <coughs> on the desktop. Um, I should note that uh, prior experience did not was not a significant Covariate, there was no significant interaction, but there was a, a positive correlation between spatial ability and experience. So, on to this one. Uh, there was also a significant interaction between shading and gender, and shading and spatial ability. So, um, it, on the left here, we see in the flat shading condition that as completion time goes up, so does spatial ability. In other words, those with high spatial ability were slower for flat shading. Um, and then the opposite was true for the smooth shading condition. So high spatial ability was a benefit for the smooth shading condition, or, or the other way around, smooth shading benefited those with high spatial ability. And then I, I put the averages in text there to show the differences in gender. Um, so f females performed better on the, in smooth shading, males performed better flat shading. For the Hansel and Gretel wayfinding task, uh, the main effect of display was not significant, but people performed better on the desktop display, so the opposite of the Where's Waldo task. Um, and then participants were faster in the smooth shading condition, again, opposite <laughs> of the Where's Waldo task, again, not significant, though. So neither of my main uh, effects for the hands on rental task list. Um, however, there were significant interactions. So the, there was a significant interaction between the desktop and, it was, sorry, between display and shading, which is not something I anticipated. So um, we see that on the desktop display, uh, participants performed faster in smooth shading conditions. And then the, you know, the opposite was true for the immersive display. So on the immersive display, participants were faster in the flat shading. And, and also, those with high spatial ability perform better across all conditions. So you see the downward slope on all, in, under all four conditions. Um, so as spatial ability score goes up, uh, completion time goes down. And then lastly, there was also a significant interaction between the shading and the spatial ability. So um, though you see that the, the medium and dark blue, the numbers are basically the same, but those with low spatial ability saw a significant performance benefit in the smooth shading conditions. They were significantly faster using smooth shading. Okay, so what is anybody supposed to do with all of this? <laughs> so there were a couple of interesting findings, I think, and the first is that shading is significant, which is not something that would have been predicted by the previous literature for these types of tasks. And um, particularly because the shading change that I made was quite minor. Um, smooth, the smooth shading that I used, so I just have an example here up on the top. The smooth shading is on the right, flat shading is on the, on the left. So obviously it is a little bit smoother, but it's, not, it's, it's basically one step up from flat shading. It's a very unsophisticated uh, version of more realistic rendering. So if that small jump provided a benefit or was significant, then 
it would be very interesting to explore that further. There are you know, endless possibilities for more sophisticated, more realistic rendering techniques. So that would be a really interesting um, follow-on research. Um, the, second, the second point is that spatial orientation and gender were significant predictors of spatial performance across different display types. So while my main effective display was not significant, meaning there was no significant difference between the displays just without any covariance, when, when I controlled for the individual differences, some people did perform better on the immersive display and also in the same goes for the desktop display. So this isn't meant to be prescriptive of who should and should not use these displays, but it could be taken as a training opportunity. So giving people more instructions or more time with a certain kind of display or even something as simple as altering instructions for using a display could um, help people see a performance benefit. And then the, the last point is interesting, and it was kind of an informal post-study, um, uh, basically a debriefing session where I asked everybody which display they preferred and why. And everybody, all but one, uh, preferred the immersive display. So regardless of whether or not they saw a performance benefit from it, they, they preferred the immersive display. Okay, so just a, a, a summary of just the overall contribution I see um, from this research. The first is, you know, more concrete. It's that I provided usable, um, re usable results and a starting point for a usability evaluation of this system. I want to be very clear that this was not meant as a comprehensive evaluation of this system. There are obviously many variables that could still be tested and, you, um, you, you know, there were limitations in my own study. However, I do think that I, I, I provided a starting point and it's beginning to paint a picture of the conditions and for whom this system could be beneficial. And then more generally, I, uh, I, the results of my study really demonstrated that the impact of individual differences are very large. So they significantly mediated the benefits seen from any other variables. So I, I, this is just a further motivating the need for their user specific and task specific usability evaluations of applications that are used today. Thank you.